Good day, and thank you for standing by. Welcome to the PAA and PAGP fourth quarter 2023 earnings conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 1-1 on your telephone. You will then hear an automated message advising your hand is raised. To withdraw your question, please press star 1-1 again. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. I would now like to hand the conference over to your speaker today, Blake Fernandez, Vice President of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you, Daniel. Good morning, and welcome to Plains All-American fourth quarter 2023 earnings call. Today's slide presentation is posted on the Investor Relations website under the News and Events section at Plains.com. An audio replay will also be available following today's call. Important disclosures regarding forward-looking statements and non-GAAP financial measures are provided on slide two. An overview of today's call is provided on slide three. A condensed consolidating balance sheet for PAGP and other reference materials are in the appendix. Today's call will be hosted by Willie Chang, Chairman and CEO, and Al Swanson, Executive Vice President and CFO, as well as other members of our management team. With that, I will turn the call over to Willie. Thank you, Blake. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Today, we reported fourth quarter and full year results exceeding expectations in both our crude oil and NGL segments. We've made considerable progress towards our long-term strategy while demonstrating continuous execution of our goals and initiatives. In summary, fourth quarter and full year adjusted EBITDA attributable PAA was $737 million and $2.71 billion respectively, with full year results exceeding the midpoint of our initial guidance by approximately $210 million or 8%. We lowered our long-term leverage ratio target range to 3.25 to 3.75 times, and we ended 2023 with a leverage ratio of 3.1 times. Our efforts to enhance the balance sheet were recognized by the credit rating agencies with two recent upgrades to mid triple B. Additionally, we completed several win-win strategic transactions in both of our both of our both in our crude oil and NGL segments, and including three Permian gathering bolt-on transactions, the sale of our interest in a Canadian fractionation facility, and the recent divestiture of approximately 600 crude oil rail cars for proceeds of approximately 40 million. These transactions are representative of our ongoing efforts to optimize our asset base and streamline our operations while generating attractive returns for unit holders. The strong EBITDA results, along with the recent bolt-on transactions and lower leverage, helped underpin a 20 cent per unit annualized increase in our common unit distribution level, which will be payable later this month and represents a 19% increase in the annualized distribution relative to 2023 levels. Turning to slide four, it should come as no surprise that our 2024 key focus areas remain very consistent with last year's. Our strong operational and equity performance over the past year only serves to reaffirm our strategy, most notably our focus on generating meaningful free cash flow, our commitment to capital discipline, and a clear and concise capital allocation framework focused on increasing return of capital to equity holders while maintaining a strong balance sheet and financial flexibility. As highlighted on slide five, we expect adjusted EBITDA attributable to PAA of 2.625 to 2.725 billion for 2024. This reflects year over year growth in our crude oil segment underpinned by continued Permian production and tariff volume growth, as well as contributions from recent bolt-on acquisitions. Our guidance also factors in a reduction in our NGL segment, primarily driven by lowered forecasted frac spreads year over year. As shown on slide six, we anticipate 2024 Permian crude oil production growth to be between two to 300,000 barrels a day, exit to exit, with the Delaware Basin driving the majority of the growth. Our updated forecast assumes an average of 300 to 320 horizontal rig rigs, and as part of our routine fundamentals forecasting process, we will continue monitoring our assumptions as the year progresses. 
Our Permian JV system is well positioned with more than 4.4 million long-term dedicated acres and operating leverage to provide customers with midstream solutions from the wellhead to demand centers. As we show on slide seven, we expect to capture approximately 275,000 barrels a day of incremental gathering tariff volumes for the full year 2024. For our long haul systems, we continue to expect high utilization on our corpus bound assets, a volume step up on Basin Pipeline, and an MVC step up on Wink to Webster. In our NGL segment, we continue to focus on optimizing the business and improving the durability of our earnings. During 2023, we closed the sale of our JV interest in Kiera Fort Sask, and we sanctioned a 30,000 barrel day debottleneck of the Plains Fort Sask complex. The debottleneck project remains on budget and unchanged in service date of mid-2025. With that, I'll turn the call over to Al. Thanks, Willie. We reported fourth quarter adjusted EBITDA of $737 million, which includes crude oil segment benefits from Canadian market-based opportunities and increased volumes across our systems, primarily in the Permian, along with NGL segment benefits from stronger seasonal sales and higher realized frac spreads. For the full year, we reported adjusted EBITDA of $2.71 billion. Strong full year performance was primarily driven by higher realized frac spreads, market-based opportunities, strong base business performance, and contributions from bolt-on acquisitions. Slides 13 and 14 in today's appendix contains walks, which provide details on our fourth quarter performance. A summary of our 2024 guidance and key guidance assumptions are on slide eight. Looking at 2024 compared to 2023, and as illustrated on the, by the EBITDA walk on slide nine, we expect adjusted EBITDA of $2.625 to $2.725 billion with year-over-year -year growth in our crude oil segment, partially offsetting commodity price headwinds in our NGL segment. Growth in our crude oil segment is primarily driven by anticipated tariff volume increases, higher fees from tariff escalators, and full-year contributions from bolt-on acquisitions. This is partially offset by our assumption of fewer market-based opportunities. We expect lower year-over-year -year NGL segment adjusted EBITDA driven by lower forecasted frac spreads, partially offset by higher C3 plus spec product sales in 2024. I would note that our C3 plus spec product sales volumes are approximately 90% hedged for the year in the mid 60 cents per gallon level. We remain disciplined with our capital investments with approximately $375 million of growth capital and approximately $230 million of maintenance capital expected for the year, net to PAA. This includes capital for POP JV well connections and intra-basin improvements, as well as an increase in our capital related to our previously announced Fort Sass debottleneck project. As illustrated on slide 10, and in addition, to a capital discipline, we remain committed to significant returns of capital and maintaining financial flexibility. For 2024, we expect to generate $1.65 billion of adjusted free cash flow, excluding changes in assets and liabilities, with approximately $1.15 billion to be allocated to common and preferred distributions, inclusive of the respective increases, resulting in $500 million of adjusted free cash flow after distributions available for value creating opportunities, including potential bolt-on acquisitions or net debt reduction. Regarding our senior note maturity profile, we have $750 million of notes maturing in November 2024, which we would expect to refinance all or a portion of during the year. With that, I'll turn the call back to Willie. Thanks, Al. Ongoing geopolitical turmoil continues to drive market volatility along with potential impacts to energy and economic policy. Despite this environment, Plains is well positioned today and going forward to continue de delivering value to our unit holders. As we show on slide 11, we've made meaningful progress on our long-term goals and initiatives to continue to reposition, to position ourselves to be the partner, employer, and the investment of choice. In summary, our balance sheet is much stronger with year-end 2023 leverage at 3.1 times. We continue to demonstrate capital discipline and patience 
as we look at additional opportunities to grow the business organically and inorganically through a creative and synergistic bolt-on acquisitions. And last but not least, we remain focused on increasing return of capital to our unit holders. We believe the world needs North American energy supply long-term and that our business will perform well in both the near-term and longer-term environment. I'll turn the call back over to Blake, who can lead us into Q&A. Thanks, Willie. As we enter the Q&A session, please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. For those with additional questions, please feel free to return to the queue. This will allow all uh, participants uh, an opportunity to ask questions in our available time this morning. The IR team will also be available to address any additional questions you may have. With that, Daniel, I'll turn the call over to you. Thank you. As a reminder, to ask a question, please press star 1-1 on your telephone and wait for your name to be announced. To withdraw your question, please press star 1-1 again. In the interest of time, we ask that you please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Our first question comes from Michael Bloom with Wells Fargo. Your line is now open. Hi, Thanks, Michael. Doug. Hey, good morning. Um, I want to ask a, a little bit on the 24 guidance. Um, your your Permian uh, Basin level growth forecast, it's pretty close to your own gathering volume growth estimate. And I'm just wondering if you could speak to that. Is that a function of your market share in the basin? Is that just a coincidence? And then uh, the guidance also assumes a, a pretty nice jump in Western volumes year over year. So I wonder if you can talk about what's driving that as well. Yeah, uh, Michael, this is Willie. Uh, the 275, maybe for clarity, it's composed of uh, two, two factors. One, uh, the M&A, uh, the bolt-on transaction volumes that we, uh, that we added um, last year, and that's about 150,000 uh, barrels a day, and then growth from the growing basin, which is about 125,000 barrels a day. And on the Western volumes, Jeremy, you want to comment on that? Yeah, if you're speaking about Delaware Basin volumes being Western, oh, Western California, that was due to some downtime at the beginning of last year. So it's basically just normalizing to the second half of the year runway and some shutdown from California refineries, which pushed more volumes to the pipe. So it's a combination of those two things. Okay, perfect. Uh, appreciate all that. And then I um, just wanted to ask, um, it, it seems like the open season on Gray Oak is uh, moving forward. So just wanted to get your views on how you see that impacting uh, your recontracting efforts on uh, cactus and then just generally on overall uh, supply versus takeaway out of the basin. Thanks. Sure. So what I would say first is the Gray Oak open season. Uh, we expect it to be successful. Uh, we're uh, continue to have constructive dialogue with our customers and see no reason why that's going to impact our re recontracting negotiations. As far as takeaway from the basin, pipes to corpus and are still full, length whips are still full. You have some flex on a, a few pipelines in the area, but as basin grows, it will tighten. But it's a constructive market. People know where they want to bring their barrels for, uh, in the future, and, and, we're, and we would continue to uh, be positive on the long haul pipes as time goes. Thank you. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from Brian Reynolds with UBS. Your line's now open. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, maybe to follow up on Michael's question on just the 300,000 barrels of, of Delaware growth, which you bifurcated between some organic and inorganic year over year. You know, just given, you know, high level planes is 50% of the market share in the Permian, uh, of which I think you're, you're more highly leveraged than Delaware. Just kind of curious if you can help us kind of square out um, kind of that gathering and long haul guide um, a little bit more. You know, do you see, you know, outside uh, gathering share opportunities, you know, in the Delaware, just given that, you know, more growth is, is expected to come from there in 24? So I think Willie outlined the, the sources of the gathering growth, but specifically Midland versus Delaware. It's a function of activity. So if you look at the number of rigs working in the Delaware, it's probably 170 to 180. You have closer to 120 working in Midland. When you offset declines in new production, that's what yields the growth. You had significant growth in the fourth quarter of last year, so you would imagine it to be 
slower in the first half, stronger in the second half, which is what is consistent with some of the public EMPs that have uh, guided so far this year. So the Delaware Basin growth is a function of activity. We do have a, a stronger position in the Delaware Basin, so that impacts us disproportionately. So I'd say that's that piece. As for the, the long haul guide, I, I think you were referring to the, the fourth quarter versus the full year long haul numbers. And what I would say there is we had a outsized contribution from Basin in the fourth quarter, a more normalized view for the year next year. Appreciate all that. Um, maybe as my follow-up, switch to capital allocation. You know, Plains enters 24 with a similar, you know, tier one free cash flow yield in the space, similar to 23. You know, last year we saw debt reduction and some opportunistic M&A along with the, with the distribution bump. So, you know, kind of curious as we look ahead to 24, preferences of, of that excess cash and specifically on M&A, do you see a similar amount of like bolt-on opportunities in 24 or are they, you know, more limited at, at this juncture to where, you know, debt reduction might be the preference? Thanks. Sure, this is Al. I, our, our focus will be to uh, uh, continue to look at potential to make investments that are accretive to our valuation. We're hopeful that we'll be successful on some bolt-on acquisitions, but, but we don't know. We feel in the, in the near term, if, if we aren't successful with that, that, you know, again, continuing to re reduce debt is not a bad alternative pending uh, that opportunity set. We do not specifically believe that we need to continue to reduce debt, however. Um, our priority will continue to be to focus on investing, returning more cash through distributions, uh, and looking for other value uh, opportunities around using that cash flow. Hey, Brian, this is Willie. Maybe I'll add something to what Al said. You know, when you think about the, the evolution of where we are, you know, I'm not saying anything people don't know, but it's pretty remarkable where the industry has gone as far as shifting to an export market. A lot of capital has gone into the industry uh, in the last decade, and I think what we're seeing right now is uh, really um, kind of a, a change in the business cycle, focus on returns, uh, which really is going to reinforce um, more opportunities for asset sales, consolidation, and really to address your question, I do think there are going to be more opportunities in there. And uh, frankly, we just need to be very patient and capture it. Our, our asset base, as you know, is well situated to be able to capture synergies across the system uh, in many of the basins we operate, but particularly the Permian. Uh, and the key now is to stay very disciplined um, and at the right valuations. Um, you know, I think we can add uh, we can add Volton just as we did last year. Great, thanks. I'll leave it there. Enjoy the rest of your morning. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. One moment for our next question. And our next question comes from Keith Stanley with Wolf. Your line's now open. Uh, hi, uh, good morning. Uh, could you maybe on, on Cactus just give a little more color on where you are at, at working uh, to recontract that pipeline, timing of when you hope to resolve it, and, and high-level goals for that. And I guess just big picture how you're thinking about, uh, you know, a desire to have contracts with medium-term duration versus operating the pipeline on a less contracted basis, depending on where price settles out. Uh, Keith, this is Jeremy. I, what I would say is uh, it's constructive for us to have this dialogue now versus where it was the last couple of years. We expect to give you guys an update on that this year, but for competitive reasons, it doesn't make sense to right now. What I would say is it, there's usually a mix, and it's largely we have to clear the basin. These pipes need to move barrels every day, and uh, the owners of the capacity on that pipeline should be someone with rateable export takeaway because that's where it's going. So in a lot of respects, it makes sense to contract those pipelines with the third parties that will be exporting the barrels. So we serve the function of aggregating barrels from the lease to the market center. We have the liquidity in our terminals. They like to partner with us. It's matching up the supply on one end with their takeaway on the other. So it needs to have a strike, a good balance of contracting with third parties and uh, some marketing opportunities. But for us, it's more weighted to contracting and partnering up with the off-takers, like in Wing to Webster, it's the refiners, like on our Corpus pipelines, it's the exporters. 
And Keith, just to make a uh, reinforce the point that Jerry made, uh, many people we talk to think that you know our partners could disappear. We, we've got great partners on this line, folks that are shipping, and so um, the way I would couch this is we've got a great relationship with our partners and the shippers on the line, and this is just a normal course of business that you have to go on on renegotiation and negotiations to as far as term and tariff. Got it. Thanks. Uh, so second question, just the, the company's had really good market-based results the past two years on, on Canadian crude spreads and, and NGL market dynamics. I think it's slide, uh, slide nine. You're assuming fewer market-based opportunities in 2024. It, is that a function of there's specific areas where you just see less opportunity this year? Uh, or is it just conservatism built in slash kind of a lack of, of visibility at this point? Just, just how you would characterize that bucket on market-based opportunities? Yeah, so market-based opportunities, um, you can't predict them. They're very difficult to, to figure out what, when something might happen. Some of this is weather. Some of it's other asset reliability. And there's all kinds of things that factor into this. Uh, and we've been pretty conscious of not trying to forecast in a, a, a large capture for things that we don't know that's going to happen. So one of the fundamental changes this year is we have, uh, not we, but the industry has uh, Trans Mountain uh, that's starting up that could impact the opportunities for, um, for crude market opportunities. So we factor all this in. And uh, to, to answer your question, we don't have a tremendous amount of, uh, we have a modest amount of, of market opportunities that we have captured that we think we can probably cap catch. Uh, the answer is, if there are opportunities out there, you know, it's in our ethos and DNA to capture markets. We've got the broad assets and a, and a company with people that focus on this every day. Um, and so if there are opportunities out there, we'll capture it. But it's very difficult to predict exactly where they happen. And, uh, again, this, this year's budget is based on a modest amount of market opportunities, and that's frankly why we move towards the range to give people kind of a uh, a range of thought of what those might be. I hope that helps. It does. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One moment for our next question. And our next question comes from Jean Salisbury with Bernstein. Your line is now open. Hi, good morning. Um, can you talk through the puts and takes of TMX starting up on planes as various assets, um, Canada, your Canada crude pipelines, flows to Cushing, et cetera? Hi, Dean, and good morning, Jeremy. Uh, it's a function of time, so it's not just linear, but at startup, you would imagine there'd be less market-based opportunities, but there'll be the opportunity for more production growth in the basin. It will offset some current flows like rail from the Williston or exports of heavy from the Gulf Coast first, and then you'll have replacement of, in our opinion, you'll have replacement of production growth in Canada. So in that initial period, there'll be less market-based opportunities. Depending upon the flows that go west, if it's lighter barrels or heavy barrels, that could impact flows to the Midwest of basin barrels or other light barrels. So there are opportunities. We're going to have to wait for it to start up and transition into full capacity that can be reached and what those flows will impact all those components. But we have a flexible system. We're touching all parts of that value chain. So if it's fee-based growth on the gathering systems, we're excited about that. As the basin tightens again and market opportunities come back, that's fine for us too. But we'll be there wherever the opportunities present themselves. Okay, um, thank you for that. And uh, just a kind of similar follow-up, um, some, Bak some Bakken contracts began to roll this year on Double H and DAPL going out of the Bakken. Um, do you anticipate any major change in how much Bakken crude makes its way kind of the westbound route down to Saddlehorn or the Cushing market or other things that could impact planes as EBITDA? Uh, sure. So there's a few things that impact it. Uh, there's certain gathering systems that feed south and certain that feed into the, the DAPL uh, system. But outside of those, those jump ball barrels, I think it'll just be competitive between the groups that head south and the, the groups that head to the, the Gulf Coast and Patoka. Uh, so we're there patient. We talk to our customers. 
Uh, Saddlehorn's largely full from DJ Basin. It has some movements from Guernsey, and those opportunities are presenting themselves. And so we'll continue to work with shippers to bring them south if it makes sense. But there should be uh, plenty of barrels to go around in that uh, area. Great. That's all for me. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from Neil Mitra with Bank of America. Your line's now open. Hi, good morning. Um, I wanted to touch on the 90% of NGL frac spreads that are hedged for 24. Obviously, um, frac spreads have printed up lately. I was wondering uh, if you're able to catch some of that um, with the incremental hedges you put on and um, how are you looking at perhaps hedging more than usual and um, you know maybe going up to 100% if you're content with this this frac spread environment right now. Uh, so Neil, the first thing it's really backwardated and until natural gas prices tanked a few weeks ago it was substantially lower. So this is relatively new and it's much higher in the front. I think 2025 is 56, 57 cents and prompt could be at 80 cents. So that, that backwardation prevents a lot of forward hedging uh, our hedges are consistent with what Al said in the mid-60s at roughly 90%. And what you could say is that the hedging profile for us is somewhat consistent with the forward market. So we're higher hedged in the front and lower hedged in the back end of the year, if that's helpful. Okay. Um, then second question, Jeremy, uh, maybe just if there's a, a way to kind of bridge where the Midland MEH uh, spread is right now for 25 and where you're looking to contract and how how we should look at it um, on a contract basis versus a spread basis when you're uh, signing up these contracts. Sure. What I would tell you, Neil, is most of these contracts are for the latter half of 25 and forward. So I, we're not really looking at the 25 market. We're looking more what is the constructed long-term rate to ship barrels from the Permian to the Gulf Coast. And so that's between us and the shippers, but we're having constructive dialogue and we're less worried about 24 and 25 and more what the long-term rate is after the contract's rolled. And when you talk to your uh, counterparties, are these three to five year contracts typically or are you looking longer? Um, if in that. I think we'll, okay. Neil, what I would suggest is we'll give you an update later in the year and give you more information. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. And one moment for our next question. Our next question comes from Jeremy Tonnet with JP Morgan Securities. Your line's now open. Hey guys, this is Ralph and Ready on for Jeremy. Uh, for my first one, I just wanted to ask on more color on the 2024 interbasin and long haul volumes. Looks like the 24 guide is down versus you know the 4Q23 rate. So if you could discuss drivers there, and as maybe a, a second part to that question, do the long haul shipments include the 50,000 know, barrel per day shipments that have already been prepaid? Uh, I'm going to go back and look for your question here. So you said interbasin volumes on the the guide versus long haul. So I'm looking at Q4 of long haul and interbasin and then for next year. You know, I would say there's probably some noise in that. Q4 had a bunch of flush production. Uh, some of that volume with Wink to Webster connecting in at Wink, some volume will go in that direction, which is actually a positive because those are shorter haul tariffs and that leads for integrated movements on our gathering system. So I'd say this is all consistent with our guidance and constructive for volume growth out of the Delaware Basin. And on the long haul side, I believe I answered that question earlier. It was just a surge in basin production in the fourth quarter and more normalized for the rest of the year. Great, thanks. And then for the second one, it uh, looks like Plains is approaching the long-term distribution coverage target. Um, so just could you walk through how you guys think about distribution pro progression from here, um, maybe versus step up and then flattening out or a more rateable, moderate step up um, in the future? Um, <clears throat> well, I think our, our current guidance uh, for this year shows 190% um, uh, 
covered. So we've, we've got a bit to go. Uh, our, our stated uh, approach will be 15 cents a year until we hit the 160%. Um, and then DCF growth will, will drive future increases there. So um, we haven't provided guidance for 25 or 26 yet. Um, but yeah, with this you know, 19 or 20 percent increase we just did, we're still at 190 percent coverage. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from Sunil Sabal with Seaport Global. Your line's now open. Yeah, hi. Good morning, everybody. So I just wanted to dwell a little bit on your gathering uh, volumes. Uh, could you give us a sense of you know, your gathering volumes in Permian, roughly you know, what percentage of that comes from your dedicated acreage versus uh, acreage where you may be competing for volumes? Hey, Sunil, this is Willie. Um, I don't know if you were on earlier, but uh, the overall gathering volume increases are 275,000 barrels a day. 150 of it's from the bolt-ons that we, we did. Uh, the remainder of the growth, 125,000, is all, really all Delaware Basin growth. Okay, no, I, I was actually referring to your current gathering volumes. Uh, I was curious, you know, in Permian, is there a good sense of what all comes from your dedicated acreages in Permian versus acreages where you may be competing for those gathering volumes? Sunil, I would say the vast majority is associated with the 4.4 million acres that Willie referenced in the script that are dedicated to the system. Understood. Uh, and then on the MLA front, it uh, seems like you know you divested some assets uh, in 2023. Could you give us a sense of, you know, from an opportunistic m &A perspective, where, where do you see the most value, uh, either basin-wise or asset-wise? Sunil, that's probably something we're not going to comment on all the what-ifs. Uh, I can assure you that we look at, uh, we run models on all kinds of different things. We look at all the different assets and opportunities to create value for our unit holders, and on the same token, uh, we look to optimize our own asset base as we've as we've proven over the last number of years. So it's a dynamic, dynamic uh, activity that happens every day. It's really hard to uh, to focus on valuations in different basins. So we'll have to maybe we can follow up with you on the off uh, offline and and see if we can answer your question a little bit better. Got it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And one moment for our next question. Our next question comes from Neil Dingman with True Securities. Your line's now open. Morning, guys. Thanks for the time. Um, my question, maybe Willie, for you or Al, is just on Permian volume expectations. Um, Bill did a good job. You mentioned the rig count, which continues to be nice and stable. But to me, what seems to get a bit lost is the improved continued DNC efficiencies that you know, happens to result in more volumes, you know, even with these similar levels. So I'm just wondering, do you all continue to see this type of upside as I do, you know, even if the, you know, if the DNC, if the rigs say stay relatively stable, are you still expecting some nice volume upside on your part? I think our forecast is consistent with what the industry is doing today, but they're all working to get better. If you look at oil in place targets and they're achieving in first recoveries less than 10%, they're trying to get higher than that. And if they do that, that would be where a big movement would be. I, what I would say, though, is consistent with our view of supply and demand and current DNC practices, I would agree with you that there's probably been 10% efficiency of just drilling completion time since the, the steadying out of the rig count. So this 300 rigs is probably doing the work of close to 330 rigs 12 months ago. But as far as recoveries, I think recoveries and the, our view of efficiencies are built into our forecast this year, but longer term, our bet would be on the US E&Ps that they would figure out how to get higher recoveries. And yeah, great, Neil, great detail. Yes, yeah, sir. Neil, remember, 
we, we do a top-down assessment. We also we have our connection forecast. It's kind of a bottoms-up, and so we factor all that together, and that's where we got our number from. Great point. Yeah, that's, uh, that's good. You all have that detail. And then my second question is just maybe on the NGL segment specifically, it looks like just wonder how you're thinking about, you know, is the – sort of level now that propane, you know, we're through the sea a bit through the season. Seems to me, you know, do you think we'll have more propane pricing pressure? And just I guess I'm just wondering how you think that's going to impact the regional basis differentials and, you know, maybe some more spot opportunities you all might have. Sure. I think that's a function of location. So uh, Fort Sask is limited on fractionation capacity, which is why we're expanding in our peers. So there could be some pressure on Buy grade prices there, I'd say, in the Gulf Coast. Production growth will continue on the NGL side as associated gas and other gas grows, uh, sources grow. And so there needs to be some expansion of dock capacity and fracks in the Gulf Coast. So you could see some issues there. But in a lot of the locations where we sell our uh, NGLs, they're uh, structurally short and inability to bring additional capacity into. So we'll continue to try to sell into those markets and maximize basis. Okay, thank you, guys. Thank you. One moment for our next question. And our next question comes from John McKay with Goldman Sachs. Your line's now open. Hey, good morning. Thanks for the time. Um, I wanted to touch again on, on Permian Crude. Just uh, on your, you know, you commented on your bottoms up estimates. Be curious if you could give us a bit of a read on what you're seeing for private versus public activity. And I think also related last year on the call, you just gave a bit of a, you know, your sensitivity to changes in basin production um, from an EBITDA basis. Maybe just a refresh on that too. Thanks. So, John, your, your first question uh, private versus public, we're not going to disclose any information for our customers, but Generally, a lot of the private inventory has been sold into the public hands, and so the privates are now buying back from the independents lesser-loved assets and starting to redevelop again. But I'd, I'd focus on the publics. It's been consolidated, so look at their growth forecast, and that's largely consistent with our forecast. And as far as the EBITDA refresh, I'm not sure I caught that question. Yeah, I guess last year on the call you said um – Maybe like a hundred thousand barrel a day swing for the basin would be like you know a ten to fifteen million dollar EBITDA impact. Just curious if that number is still fair for twenty four. There's some uh, other moving pieces in there to refresh. Yes, yes, sir. That's consistent with the contracting profile we have. So there's not a lot of turn in the contract, so it doesn't really change much. Cool. And then just just to follow up, um, kind of staying in the same theme. But when you guys did the Oryx buy-in, part of the the narrative was, hey, eventually over time we should be able to use this bigger footprint to flow more, flow more volumes into our long haul side. Just curious if you could give us a bit of an update there, and uh, maybe if we look at your ratio of kind of gathering to long haul volumes going forward, maybe how that ratio changes from here or uh, or not. Thanks. Well, one thing is I wouldn't consider the Oryx buy-in, right? That's our partner in the – we merged those assets together, so I just want to make sure we're clear on that. Uh, sure. But Thank second, the, the JV's done exactly what we thought we would, and I would say uh, it's bolstered our relationship with our customers across the basin and given us the opportunity to provide integrated economics. But as for – the markets will dictate where barrels flow and pricing dictates where they flow, and so we uh, – we have strong relationships and the ability to contract our pipes, but they can only be so full, and so barrels have to flow in other directions as well. And we're completely comfortable with that. All right, that's clear. Appreciate the time today. Thank you. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from Teresa Chen with Barclays. Your line is now open. Morning. I had a um, a quick follow up related to um, Jean Ann's earlier question on um, TMX's impact on your crude marketing business. Um, completely understanding that you know the um, differentials to both Midcon and Gulf Coast should be uh, um, constrained, especially upon line fill. But as TMX delivers barrels to the West Coast. 
you know, backing out some of the Middle East and LATAM imports and given your um, liquid infrastructure business there as well as your marketing presence, is that potentially a source of upside to crude marketing in 2024 um, relative to opportunities in 2023 as those waterborne imports are backed out and the flows and differentials change um, in California? You know, Teresa, this is Willie. It's a complex question that uh, uh, that's hard to put a put a pen to. What I what I can assure you is that we have a very flexible system, and that wherever flows will go, um, I think we'll be able to uh, adapt to that and capture value, perhaps in different parts of our system. You know, long term, I look at this as um, very constructive because um, with more takeaway capacity uh, to the West Coast, um, I think it allows a, a a uh, better price signal to producers to be able to produce more. Uh, short term, we could see some headwinds, but I can assure you that uh, we'll adapt to that. Uh, whatever the markets are, you know, we, we're going to try to look and see how we can use our assets to capture capture value. Thank you. Thanks, Teresa. Thank you. And one more for our next question. Our next question comes from Tim Schneier with the Schneier Capital Group. Your line's now open. Hey, good morning, guys. It's been a while. How are you? Hi, Tim. Um, quick, thanks for all the color on the Permian. Quick question for me, kind of higher level question on a sector strategic initiative. So we've seen a ton of um, M&A activity on the upstream side. We really saw some of these blockbuster transactions. So I have two, two questions for you on this. Number one, how do you view upstream M&A specifically kind of for planes and for the midstream sector? Is that is that good for you, bad for you, kind of neutral? And the second follow-up I have to that is how do you think upstream M&A, this large-scale large scale upstream M&A, ultimately trickles to the midstream sector? Because we haven't really seen any blockbuster transactions there, right? We've, we've seen one big deal over the last, call it 12 to 18 months that had some, call it tax attributes to it, or is it more so smaller bolt-ons and that's the way to go? So just curious as to what your thoughts are on that. Well, Tim, uh, short answer on the question for upstream consolidation and the impact on planes. Uh, with our asset base and the relationships we have, I don't think it's going to be uh, a material impact on us. We, we work with, um, if not all, most of the large players. Um, so we've got volumes that flow on our systems today and they're, they're, they're tied with contracts. And the way I think about it is if you, if you have stronger counterparties um, in tougher environments, um, we're fine if they want to develop the Permian in a more thoughtful and efficient way uh, because we, we're a long-term company and we want to be around for a long time. So whether or not the production comes this year, next year, or the following year, um, the stability is, is probably a very positive thing for us. And then when you think about um, the midstream, my, my observations are I do think the upstream is a bit ahead of us. Um, I do think there will be some more consolidation. Assets are probably the easiest way to go. And uh, again, as, we, as you look at the landscape, there has been some M&A in the midstream. But I think we are in the in the part of the business cycle where there are more opportunities to to be bigger and be stronger. Not that we aren't uh, a large uh, enterprise, but uh, we'll we'll evaluate different opportunities as we go, always with the unit holder in mind. All right, thank you. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. I'm showing no further questions at this time. I would now like to turn the call back over to management for closing remarks. Well, listen, thanks for, to all of you for your interest in planes, and we will look forward to updating you uh, as the year progresses. Everyone have a nice weekend. Thank you. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.